We've done 10 deals since, over a thousand units, sitting on 762 right now. We've sold six of them, had six exits. So we're looking, looking to capitalize on some distressed opportunities this year. Welcome everyone to our Hero Capital Raising Show. I'm your host, Tim Mai. And today I have a really awesome guest on the line with us. Super excited to interview him. He's one of those up and coming rising star that's growing super, super fast. Mr. David Lilly and David started real estate investing in 2013 with the purchase of his first single family rental and has since transitioned to multifamily, starting with his first six units uh, in 2008. And um, now since that 2018, David has sponsored uh, the purchase of over a thousand multifamily units valued at over $130 million dollars and uh, has personally raised over $38 million in the process. Starting from scratch, David has direct experience in every facet of real estate acquisitions, redevelopment, and property management. Uh, prior to his career in real estate, David served as an infantryman in the United States Marine Corps with one combat deployment to Afghanistan. He worked as a firefighter, paramedic, and was specially trained in multiple technical, res technical rescue disciplines. He later worked under the Department of State, providing close protection to the DOS officials to include the Secretary of Defense. He was deployed multiple times to uh, Baghdad. And finally, David uh, was also deployed multiple times to the Southern Philippines in direct support of the SOCOM as a search and rescue paramedic. With that, let's give David a huge welcome, y'all. Woohoo! Hi, me, Tim. Glad to be yeah, here. Yeah, thanks for being here with us today. Uh, yes, share with us, like, what got you interested in real estate to begin with, and especially about your transition into multifamily? Yeah. Yeah. I always viewed owning a home as like the first kind of first step to investing. I've always been honed in on investing in general. It started when I turned 18, obsessed with a credit score, having a perfect credit score and building my credit. Bought a motorcycle when I got out of boot camp and I was fine paying the 17% interest rate because I knew it's, it's just something I had to do to build that credit. I was just always really honed in on it. I felt like I was just throwing money away, paying rent and paying down someone else's mortgage. And at the time, 2013, it was much different, but I was in, in that first house for, I think three grand and years later I walked 90. And so at that point I was hooked on real estate and the next question was, okay, how do I scale this? Do I continue buying single family homes or do I just, I want multifamily buildings. So at, at that point I had stumbled upon bigger pockets and learned about economies of scale and multifamily. So I took the jump, bought that first six unit place in Tampa and the rest is history. We've done 10 deals since over a thousand units sitting on 762 right now. We've sold six of them, had six exits. So we're looking, looking to capitalize on some distressed opportunities this year. That's very awesome. Yeah. Share with us what, I assume with the single family homes, that was pretty easy. Did you use your own money as a down payment for yeah. that house? I, okay. <clears throat> yeah. So share with us what your, when did you do your very first raise for the syndication business? Yeah. Yeah. So that first six unit deal was really a joint venture. There was no fees, no, no waterfall. It was all pro rata. It was me, a family member, a good buddy of mine and his coworker. So we all we just had pro rata based on our contribution. And then the, the second deal that we bought a couple of months later in Chandler, Arizona, that 16 unit, that was really our first syndication, first, first raise. <clears throat> and then, you know, it's just, we started with our close friends and family network and have since just branched out from there. I see. And how much was that, that, that raise? That raise was 450,000. Yeah. Okay. The, so still first, fairly small. Yeah, it was, it was small. That first raise was 350 and it went, I put up almost 60% of the money. I felt it like it was my obligation to do so since I had no experience. And we had a ton of interest from our networks, me and my buddy, that was my business partner in the deal. 
And so when this next deal came across our plate, we we're like, shoot, this will be simple. We just raised 350. This is 450, no problem. It ended up, we barely closed that deal. We were barely able to raise the money. I had to take out fifty thousand mm. dollar personal loan, made my wife take out a fifty thousand dollar personal loan. So we had to get creative. We ended up selling that deal, I think 16 months later and, and made a handsome profit. So it, it worked out. But gotcha. Uh, okay, a, let's a little bit of risk. Yeah, I love that. So let's take a little bit into that. Like what made that race the yeah, what made that race uh difficult for you? Just the lack of experience and track record, I think is what it boils down to. I had no professional experience. I was graduated, I was a marine firefighter, so no no real institutional or professional experience as a real estate investor. I had learned some being a single family landlord, but I I definitely wasn't a money manager. So that's the biggest hurdle. I think most of the new sponsor syndicators are going to have to overcome. <clears throat> and one of the ways you can do that is by partnering with someone that has that experience, which I just didn't have that right partner and mentor at the time. And frankly, I was probably just hard headed and felt like I could just do it on my own. Yeah. So let's talk about that. So if, if you were to start over again, like being new again in the shoes of mm -hmm. some of the people on here that are new, how would you have went about doing your first raise, doing your first deal? Mm -hmm. I would have made more of an effort to find that mentor or that partner with experience, someone that had owned properties and had successful exits because I spent about a year just underwriting deals and reading every forum post on bigger pockets and reading every book I could on real estate. <clears throat> and I felt like I learned a ton, but just operating that first six unit property, I learned exponentially more than I had learned on my own just by doing it. And so having a mentor or someone that, that had done that before, they, they could have helped me avoid some costly mistakes. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. No, that having a mentor definitely would help a lot. So when did capital raising, especially let's actually, let me, let me rephrase that. You came in 2018, pretty much at the height of the market. And during that time for a lot of people, raising money was fairly easy, right? I know you had your challenges in, in that first deal, but at what point did it became easier for you? How many deals in was that? I would say, really, I feel like I had always heard the 10th deal is where money stops being uh, an obstacle. And I found that to be true. We just closed our 10th deal in December. Biggest raise we've had, $10 million raise with a plus $5 million in pref, so 15 in equity. And that was it was the smoothest raise we've had to date. Yeah, I would say around eight, eight, nine, ten. But that deal was also the first time we had really worked uh, with different fund managers at a larger scale. So that certainly helps too. You guys right. are really good at what you do. Thanks. Yeah. Tent deal. The the difference between raising during the height of the market versus where it is now. And I know it gets easier for you. Now you're like, you're dealing with a different challenge, right? You're dealing with a challenge of the market versus dealing with a challenge of being a, a new syndicator. Share with us, what are some of the challenges you're dealing with now when it comes to capital raising and how are you, how are you overcoming that, those challenges? Yeah, it's mainly focused on the existing assets in the portfolio and making sure that they're performing because a savvy investor, that should be their first question, especially right now. How are your deals performing currently? So we were pretty fortunate in that we grew at a reasonable pace. So we don't have, and we were, we were able to exit six out of the 10 deals. So right now, we, three of the four properties we own, we bought last year after the Fed had raised rates. So we've got one deal that we bought in 2022. And so we have few fewer problems than most maybe. So that, that enables us to put, we've got good results to show as far as our properties go and their performance. And that certainly makes it easier to raise money knowing that there's not a, just a ton of the skeletons in the closet. Okay. And um, like how a lot of people 
uh, get caught up in the height of that market and continue to pretty aggressively bought. Um, you know, so what what was it about the market? What was it about you know you that that had to uh, pull out early and and not not yeah not having to go into deals that were marginal that might have gotten you in trouble now? Yeah, yeah. I think we've always been maybe more disciplined than others in in our underwriting assumptions that we use. I know our exit cap rates, for instance, are um, much higher than some of our competitors. <clears throat> so that helps. But also, I feel like a lot of people that have gotten in trouble, they bought a value add deal and they didn't add any value. They didn't execute on the the renovations and, because it's tough to do, especially at sales. So they were one of those groups that just bought a ton of properties. Yeah, it's just really tough to execute. Yeah, I think that's one of the biggest reasons. Gotcha. Okay. And um, yeah, so you you stayed out for most of 2022 now you know you're since 2022 you said you bought one deal in 22 and how many in 23 we actually bought two in 22 three oh, okay. in 23 okay yeah I think so i think that's yeah Got, gotcha okay no, and it, yeah yeah two and 22 yeah that's right okay and are you fully integrated now in your business we are. Yeah. So we've we've brought construction and property management in-house. Construction last year, property management the year before. So we handle every aspect of the investment at this point. Okay. And what market do you specialize in? Dallas-Fort Worth. Deal one and two was in Tampa and Phoenix metros, respectively. And then we were able to break into the Dallas market. And this is our home base. This is where I grew up and where most of the corporate team grew up as well. So we know the area extremely well. We have great networks here, which is critical in getting the good deals. You know, the brokers are the gatekeepers and we've got great relationships with all of them. A lot of these guys grew up with a number of them. That certainly helps. And Dallas, that's arguably one of the best growth market in the nation. There's a few others on our radar, but as long as there's de enough deals to be had in Dallas, we're going to keep acquiring here. Gotcha. And what's what's your outlook looking for twenty twenty four here? Like when you, um, I guess this two part questions, uh, your outlook, and then also how are you applying that in your underwriting uh, to to be able to grow at the pace that you're you're going after? Yeah, as far as underwriting this year, we're underwriting for zero percent rent growth in Dallas. I think the third party data suggests. One, two, three percent, something like that. But I think this year there's just too much unknown. It, it makes it very tough to underwrite, which is why we're really focused on truly distressed opportunities this year. Ideally, lender owned or foreclosures or soon to be foreclosed on properties. So most of the deals that we've seen go to market through normal channels haven't really penciled. <clears throat> But yeah, the underwriting assumptions are key. That that rent growth, yeah, it's a tricky one. It's really anyone's guess. I don't think anyone really knows. Okay. And where you see the market, like the yeah, where do you see the markets going here in perhaps the, the next couple of years? I think 2025 and 2026 are going to be great years for rent growth in Dallas-Fort Worth, um, just due to the supply and new supply dropping off a cliff in those years. Long term, I think the outlook is fantastic for Texas and, and Florida and probably the Carolinas and, and many of these good markets that you guys know. <clears throat> yeah, it's a tough question. Okay. And so when you're saying you're underwriting, assuming that there's zero rent growth, are you so are you having to buy just at a deeper discount or are you but underwriting, thinking that maybe the cap rate will get compressed any in the next, at least in the in the next five years or so, so that way the yeah. deal can become profitable for you. Yeah, there we haven't seen very many six cap or, or greater deals here in Dallas. If 1980s or newer, they're still most trading around in the fives somewhere. So <clears throat> there's we're not modeling for really any cap rate compression. Okay. If that answers your question. Yeah, it does. It does. So I guess, and, and my question is similar to what Mitchell wrote here in the text, uh, in, the, in the chat, in the sense of what, you know, what are you modeling for that would have these deals pencil out if red growth is not there, cap rate compression is not there, 
Um, <clears throat> yeah. It's really, we're, we're focused on the deals with just a, a really low going in basis. So we're honed in on that. That certainly helps, helps the deals pencil, but really it's just a matter of putting all the numbers on paper and, and seeing what they tell you based on where the in-place rents are compared to the comps. The store, story of the deal is huge. We've got a couple of boxes that we need to check right now, kind of pass the sniff test and Locations one, story, story is the another. Those are two that are very important for us. And then basis was the third one. Gotcha. And you, I assume you're planning on um, specializing in the DFW area for um, the foreseeable future. Is that correct? I think this will continue to be our focus for the foreseeable future. We would like to jump into some other markets because Dallas isn't the only place that's going to be growing. I, I think they're Plenty, plenty of other areas to make to make great investments in, but yeah, Dallas will be will continue to be our focus for sure. I see. Okay, in terms on the capital raising side, especially in today's market, what what are like maybe the top three or so channels that or strategies that you have found or that you're finding that's working well for you and your team right now? Of in the past year or so, I've made a concerted effort to just increase my network and exposure on LinkedIn. And I feel like that's been a huge, huge game changer for me in the business and just getting our name out there in front of people. So LinkedIn is huge. These podcasts are huge, obviously, and just attending events and conferences. And it's all about networking. None of this would be possible without a network. So that's probably the most important thing, but also having a track record and executing, doing what you say you're going to do. Yeah. Building your reputation. Definitely. Very important. Exactly. Yeah. On, on the LinkedIn, what are you doing on, on, on there? Just trying to provide valuable content. What we're seeing in the market makes up a lot of the content that I post about just trying to provide valuable content to my network, the people that I'm connected with. Gotcha. And I assume do you have a team member that helps you also connect with like more people and try to connect as many, make as many connections as you can? Or is there any like specific strategy around LinkedIn that you're not, in? yeah, not connections. <clears throat> I've seen that they, there's definitely tools that you can use to help grow the network. I haven't used it on LinkedIn. I did just hire a uh, full-time marketing guy this year. So he's really focused on more, more on like the Instagram, um, Instagram side. He posts on every channel really, but most of the content that I post is my own. I see. Okay. So you mentioned now that you have your track record, capital raising is a lot easier. And then you also mentioned you're starting to utilize fund managers as well. And it sounds, yeah, it sounds you have, you're having good experience with utilizing fund managers. Is that correct? We are. Yeah. It's been yeah, extremely easy to work with great guys and gals. Okay. Have you uh, started utilizing family offices or any of those we do type have, of uh, I think investors? we have, yeah, I think we have two or three that have invested in our deals, not to a huge degree. I think a million was the most we've had coming in. So it's mainly retail investors. We've got a kind of semi-institutional co-GP partner that we've partnered with on the past two deals. But other than that, it's, it's our network of 350, 400 investors, whatever it is, and the networks of the fund managers that we work with as well. Okay. Do you get a lot of referrals from your existing investors? Is that a strategy that you you specifically? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Word of mouth is the biggest, the biggest driver of of new business, really, new relationships. And how are you going about cultivating that and asking for that referrals? Do you just ask that? As you're talking to them, do you host any kind of like an investor appreciation dinner or lunch or anything like that? We do. Yeah, we, we do. We've done a number of happy hours. So that's, we try to put on an investor events to get everyone together and just network and talk. So that's always fun. But also as a function of our like sales investor relations process, our investor relations team is, <clears throat> and, and I do to a certain degree, call up our existing investor touch base see what they're working on, have any allocations they need to make this year, if they've got tax liabilities that they need to need to cover, things like that. So just trying to stay in 
chapter one and just cultivate. I see. Okay. And with you grew up in Dallas, does investors locally make up the bulk of your investors database or are your investors all so. over? Yeah. That's yeah. Yeah, well, mainly, that's definitely yeah I'd say mainly in Dallas, Texas. Yeah. But they're all yeah nationwide at this point. But yeah, I would say they're concentrated in, in the DFW metro. That's good. Okay. Definitely helps a lot. And when you're people like to be able to drive to the assets they're invested in. And then is there any specific like avatar that you attract more of than others? As far as an investor? Yeah. Uh-huh. Like the, the type of profession. <sighs> I don't or think that... so. Yeah, I don't think so. They're it really seems like it's just all all across the board, all walks of life, younger, older, everything in between, all various professions. Yeah, we haven't really made a focus to go after the dentists or the docs or whatever. And so how big is your team now? Um, the corporate team's 12. I, I think we just made a couple of hires this week. I think in total, we're around 35 with all our property maintenance or property management staff. Gotcha. Okay. So when you say your corporate is 12, is that, mm -hmm. so that's outside of the property management and is that also outside of the construction part? Is it just mainly the- So that's the across all three companies. Yeah. Oh, okay. Across all three companies. Yeah. So REAP Capital, REAP Management, REAP Construction, yeah, across all three of those, right. 12 on the corporate team. So at, in the office or a mixture on-site, off-site. And the rest are dedicated property staff, property management staff that are assigned to a property. That's their home base. I see. Okay. I understand. So what share with us like some of the lessons that you learned in 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 your growth here? Because your growth is pretty impressive. You have in the last six, seven years or so that you've been doing it's been this. Good. Yeah. It, it's been uh, I'm certainly happy with it. I think, yeah, if I could give some advice, it would be the little things matter. All Every little thing matters because it adds up. They all add up to big results. We're working on, it could be something as trivial as just being easy to work with. We're working on probably the deal of our, uh, since the best deal that, that we've ever come up, a lender that's foreclosing on an asset and they brought it to us exclusively and only us because we had experience working with them. And they said, hey, you guys were easy to work with. So we're going to give you guys the first crack at this. So it's something as simple as that could can make a huge difference. So I'm really focused on just doing all the little things well because I like they add up. All right. No, that's Everything definitely, matters. Yeah, definitely good advice. What are some of the the tools that you use in your business that that you like a lot? Uh, the CRM is something that we hadn't, we had a CRM, but it was part of our investment management software and it just wasn't very good. So we've branched out to a dedicated CRM for our investor relations side. And that's been huge for us. So that's been a great piece of software. And then we just migrated our whole portfolio from RealPage to Atfolio on the property management side. And that's been a real game changer. I don't, yeah, it's, in my opinion, it's hands down the most superior product. There's just, there's a, yeah, we could do a whole nother podcast on that. But if, yeah, if anyone's looking for some good property management software, I would implore you to give that thing a demo because it's been great for us. All right. Okay. So I know you mentioned earlier that if you were to do it all over again, getting a mentor would be a, a um yeah would be a really big one uh is there any other uh big things that you would have done differently if you were starting over especially considering the market that we're in right now yeah so it's yeah it's tricky um if we were in a different place um as a business as a company I would have probably sat out once the fed started raising rates like a lot of the big groups did they were wise. They didn't need to, they didn't, they weren't focused on growth or didn't need to grow, didn't need to keep transacting, but we wanted to continue growing. We wanted to continue buying good opportunities. And at the time, working with the the market data that we had, using assumptions that worked at that time, the deals we bought were great and we would have done it again. But 
since the market has shifted, rents have softened. We're dealing with this 40-year high in new supply. So dealing with a lot of, turns out all our underwriting assumptions were wrong on some of these deals. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of wisdom in sitting out, it seems, that some of the groups showed. Yeah. I know asset management is probably a really big one that you know, that you get to learn, especially when you're talking about assumptions going wrong. And so, share with us some of your lessons around managing through. I don't have you had any type of capital call or pause distributions on any of your deals. Yeah, we've paused distributions on two two out of the four right now are heavy value add deals. So we we had no plans to issue distributions on those for two years. So those are going according to the plan. The other two, we shut off distributions end of last year when, we were, at least in Dallas, everyone's occupancy took a huge hit at the end of last year. There was negative absorption. You're not making money when you dip below 90. So we shut off distributions at that time and we're just focused on stabilizing for 90 days at this point. As far as asset management goes, until you operate a 60s, 70s, even 80s vintage property, you really don't realize how expensive they are, at least like in regards to repairs and maintenance. It's a lot more than that seller's T12 reflects. So there's a lot of creative accounting things that you can do. <laughs> so that's, yeah, it's just, that's just one area that you've got to, you just have to know it's going to, it's going to cost probably a lot more than you think in terms of repairs and maintenance. I see. Share with us like one of your deals that you have right now that perhaps you have the most challenging and you have to do a lot of things uh, around asset management that you, yeah, like mm -hmm. you have to be creative for. Yeah. So the one we bought in 2022 is probably the most challenged, but it's really, it's a beautiful asset, but the pocket that it's in in Dallas has just gotten hit really hard with vacancy and delinquency. Mm -hmm. So all our, even they're some of the biggest operators in Dallas own in, in the same neighborhood and they're dealing with the same issues, 10 plus percent in bad debt that just seemingly there's no end to it. We've gotten super aggressive with being the cheapest rent in the comp set to drive occupancy because turnover is just so expensive. Um, so that's what we've been focused on that property as far as asset management goes, just retaining tenants focus on those renewals and getting heads in beds. Gotcha. Okay. All right. We're going to wrap up this a part of our interview and then we'll open up for Q&A here in just a little bit. For the folks that want to reach out to you, connect with you, learn from you, potentially invest with you, where would you like to uh, send them? Yeah. Go to our website. It's reapcap.com, R-E-A-P-C-A-P.com. Go to the contact us deal. You can submit a contact form, or there's also an area to schedule a call directly with me. You can shoot me an email also, david at reapcap.com. <clears throat> Find me on LinkedIn. Yeah, I'd be happy to talk or help or offer, offer advice. I'm always willing to help out a fellow investor. Awesome. Yes. And just for clarification, because there's, because I get confused myself too, REAP is R E A P. Because we yeah. do have another REAP Capital that uh, the Gazers run, it, which we've interviewed Arlene. The REAP on, Equity, on, is that yeah, REAP Equity on, guys? On, yeah. on, on our show as well. So yeah, it's reapcap.com. So David, thank you so much for doing this interview with me. 